Welcome to the first session of the NLF Imaginary Lines Book Club for parents and educators based on the book Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital Age, written by Marianne Wolf. We are very excited to be here and we hope you are too. Reader Come Home is a book that is structured in the form of letters to a reader. As Marianne Wolf looks at what happens to the human brain when we read and how we can nurture the practice of deep reading in, a, in an age of digital distraction. More than a decade ago, Marianne Wolf's first book, Proust and Squid and the Squid, revealed the science of the reading brain. But then the world changed into our digital world, in which we read more, but we read differently. New research on the reading brain chronicles these changes in the brains of children and adults as they learn to read while immersed in a digitally dominated medium. Drawing deep on this research, the letters in this book engage us in a conversation as Miss Wolf writes to us, her beloved readers, to describe her concerns and her hopes of what is happening to the reading brain as it unavoidably changes to adapt to digital culture. The letters share the need to build deep reading because our capacity for critical thinking, empathy and reflection is deeply influenced by our reading. And this is more true today as we and our children are doing everything digitally. Our, reader, our speaker today invites us to the thought that to help our children to be deep readers, we must first reflect on our own reading brain and how it is structured by what we read and how we read with Reader Come Home the reading brain in a digital age. NLF Imaginary Lines aims to blur the dividing lines between digital and physical reading, between adults and children's reading, and between readers and non-readers. Before we introduce our speaker, we would like to go over some housekeeping rules with the audience. You can ask your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. In fact, if you already have your questions ready, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box right away. We will discuss questions around 30 to 40 minutes into the session. If you raise your virtual hand, we would not be able to attend to your question. Hence, we recommend that you use the Q&A box to share your thoughts and your questions with us. We will be putting up a few polls as well during the webinar in order to engage with you further and would love for you to participate in the same. We will share the poll results with you during the Q&A segment. Now I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for the day, author and psychologist Aruna Sankar Narayanan. Welcome Aruna to the NLF Imaginary Lines Book Club. Thank you, Kavita. Aruna currently writes for the Hindu, Deccan Herald, and the Financial Express on teaching, learning, work, relationships, and well being. She authors a monthly column, Youth, that addresses issues on young adults and blogs at www.arunasankarnarayanan.com. Her first book, Zero Limits, is due uh, on the challenges that, uh, of relationships that uh, adults, uh, that 20 something should know and will be published by Rupa Publications in 2020. She was the founder and director of Prayatna, a center for children with learning difficulties for 22 years. Aruna holds a doctorate in psychology. The incredible gift for us is that Aruna joins us for this inaugural session of the book club revolving around Dida Come Home as Marianne Wolf, the author of the book, was one of Aruna's mentors and was on her doctoral thesis committee. Aruna continues to regard Marianne as someone who's very special to her. In today's session, the first one out of four, Aruna will discuss the topics of the first three letters in Reader Come Home. Letter one, reading the canary in the mind. Letter two, under the big top, an unusual view of the reading brain. And letter three, Deep reading, is it endangered? She will go over the lessons the act of reading holds for us today, what happens in our brain when we read, and whether deep reading is endangered in the digital age. Over to you, Aruna. Uh, thank you, Kavita. Good evening parents, educators, and fellow readers. 
Firstly, I would like to thank Kavita Gupta Sabarwal and Kartika Gopalakrishnan for inviting me to NLF online. Uh, I was especially excited when they asked me to facilitate a book club discussion on Reader Come Home by Marianne Wolf. I was really impressed that they remembered reading an article I had written about a year ago in the Deccan Herald. As Kavita said, Marianne was one of my mentors while I was doing my PhD. And I have learned so much from her, both academically and otherwise. And most of all, Marianne is one of those rare kind of individuals who touches your life in a very deep way. And I think that is evident in her writing as well. And I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from her. Like Kavita said, in today's session, I will be focusing exclusively on the first three chapters or letters of the book. Uh, Kartika, my slides are not moving down. Oh, wait. Yeah, got it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Wolf's passion for the printed word is evident right from the beginning of the book. Uh, the very fact that she chose to write her book as a series of letters suggests that she wants to forge a bond with the reader. In other words, she wants to make a connection with somebody who is like her, somebody who loves the printed word. Wolf also says that a letter allows for a true dialogue between the reader and the author. And ultimately, what is reading other than having a conversation with the author? Wolf also says that the letter format brings a certain lightness especially when we are discussing weighty matters. Professor Wolf could easily have written an academic tome, yet she chose to write a book that is accessible to the lay reader because that is whom she intends to reach. That is whom she wants her message to go to. I assume that uh, most people who've logged on to this webinar is either a reader or hopes to become a reader and wishes you had more time to read. How many of you have a wish list of books uh, that keeps getting longer? Or you have a pile of books on your bedside table that keeps increasing, or more likely on your Kindle reader nowadays? Uh, many of you may have grown up reading on lazy summer afternoons, but as adulthood encroached and personal and professional responsibilities took on increasingly large chunks of time, reading somehow gets sidelined. We want to read more, yet we don't seem to have the time. But the more fundamental question is whether a lack of time is the only problem. The book that Wolf refers to in this quotation is, her, is the first popular book that she wrote, Proust and the Squid. Um, in the seven years that it took her to research and write this book, that is from 2000 to 2007, something fundamental changed. The act of reading itself was undergoing a transformation. So as we morphed from a print-based culture to a digital one, our brains were being rewired and reshaped. And at that point, there wasn't sufficient research to document the shift and more importantly, the cause of the shift. First, I would like us to step back in time to when we only had printed books, before smartphones and iPads invaded our lives, before the term to Google had entered our vocabularies, uh, when we used to read the newspaper when we had to find out about the news, or we looked up encyclopedias as opposed to running to Wikipedia. Uh, we tended to read books cover to cover and uh, typically from beginning to end. So what was going on in our minds and brains when we read books the good old fashioned way? First, we were able to read books for extended durations of time 
And while reading, our minds processed and digested what our eyes took in. As Wolf says, we were cultivating slower cognitive processes of critical reasoning, imagination, personal reflection, and empathy. And this uh, uh, array of skills is what she refers to as deep reading. At the end of her first letter, Wolf quotes one of her favorite writers, Marcel Proust. And I will read this out because this is a very powerful quotation. It seemed to me that they would not be my readers, but readers of their own selves. My book being merely a sort of magnifying glass, I would furnish them with the means of reading what lay inside themselves. So ultimately, reading is about knowing ourselves. A book is like a mirror through which we see ourselves and the world around us. In other words, reading is a form of self-reflection. So what happens when someone is immersed in a book? Not only is the person reading what is printed on the page, but a whole host of cognitive activity is going on in the reader's mind. Reading may look like a very passive process where a person is just sitting in one place, but deep or active reading actually engages the person in multiple ways. According to Nicholas Carr, who authored the book, The Shallows, uh, about how the internet is rewiring our brains, reading makes us more contemplative, reflective, and imaginative. Now, Wolf fully appreciates the benefits that the digital age has bestowed on us. From being able to access uh, information at our fingertips, to democratizing knowledge, at least to an extent, uh, the information age has brought us umpteen benefits. The very fact that we can have this webinar from the comfort of our homes in these troubling times attests to the power and influence of the net. However, Wolf also raises a clarion call that we need to pay attention not just to what we read and how much we read, but how we read. We need to examine the process of our own reading. Unlike learning a spoken language, uh, which most children acquire without any instruction or formal tutoring, reading is neither natural nor innate. Kids automatically learn to speak languages they are exposed to. But in order to read, they need formal instruction. Moreover, it takes years for a child to become a deep reader. I am not talking about merely decoding words printed on a text, but I am talking about deciphering meaning, complexity and difficulty. So reading is a cultural invention that has to be learned and honed over the years. Now, attention is fundamental to almost everything that we do, including reading. So how does the attentional system relate to the process of reading? First, we need to disengage from whatever we are doing now. In all probability, it, it's in today's age, it's, it'll be checking our phones or looking at email or looking at social media. Next, we have to shift the spotlight of our attention to what needs to be read. And third, we need to maintain and sustain our focus while we read. But the net and uh, all our digital devices keep vying for our attention and they keep interfering and fragmenting our attention so that every stage of the attentional process is compromised. The Roman philosopher Seneca captures the perils of multitasking, where we try to do too much, but end up doing nothing 
thoughtfully, meaningfully, and wholeheartedly. So now what happens when a person reads deeply? What goes on in their heads? First, when we read, we make connections between what the author is saying and perhaps something in our own lives. We may, we may make linkages between what the author has said and what we have read earlier in another book. We may also make associations between what we are reading and something going on in the world, either historically or some or current events. In our conventional system of education, the onus of asking questions is typically left to the teacher. But in order to develop uh, critical reasoning, reasoning faculties, it's very important that children learn to ask questions and they need to question what they read as well. Furthermore, when we read, we don't remember everything that we peruse and we needn't. But as we read, we need to determine what is salient, what is relevant, what is the take home message that I want from this book. Reading also involves making inferences. We don't just read at the surface level of the word and sentence, but we read beyond what is the author implying? What is the deeper message that the author might be conveying? And reading is also a sensorial process where we actually, a uh, mini video may play out in our minds if it's a very evocative text. And finally, we may read from disparate sources and suddenly everything, different thoughts may piece together and we may uh, achieve an original thought. So there's so much going on when a person is reading. But what happens when we read online? The processes look very different. Skimming and scanning seem to dominate screen-based reading. We skim and keep scrolling down either with a cursor or with our eyes. Our research also indicates that when we read online, our eyes trace the letters of a capital F. So we may read the first couple of sentences completely and then our eyes jump around and somewhere in the middle we again read a little bit. So this keyword spotting and browsing seem to be the dominant methods and reading tends to be incomplete and non-linear. Additionally, advertisements, pictures and notification keep jostling for our attention. Wolf emphasizes that how we read matters because it takes years for deep reading circuits to form in the brain. The processes involved in deep reading don't emerge overnight. They develop as a reader encounters different kinds of te texts, different genres of varying levels of difficulty that make different cognitive demands on the reader. So from reading, from learning to read, we progress to reading to learn. Reading becomes a conduit to knowledge. So as children encounter different kinds of texts, they realize that authors themselves have perspectives and points of view. And gradually readers learn to start looking at works critically and identifying authors as assumptions, for example. Uh, Nicholas Carr describes an experiment uh, in his book, The Shallows, where there were two groups of students, uh, where they were given two articles. One group was told to read the articles linearly. That is, they were told to read the first article and then go to the second article. Uh, the same articles were given to the two groups and the articles were comparing two theories of knowledge. The second group was given articles with hyperlinks where they could toggle back and forth between the two pieces. And the researchers hypothesized that the hyperlinks would help the readers make comparisons between the two articles. However, on a subsequent test of comprehension, those who read linearly outperformed those who jostled between the links. 
So the researchers concluded that the hyperlinks actually interfered with learning. Likewise, a literature scholar, Natalie Phillips, uh, examined another facet of reading. She teamed up with neuroscientists at Stanford University to see how the brain uh, responds to different approaches to reading. So um, she gave students of literature the same piece of fiction. Again, the students were divided into two groups. One group was told to read the piece of fiction like they would read a literature text. That is, they had to pay attention to nuances of meaning, uh, sentence structure, and, uh, and read very closely. The second group was given the same piece of fiction, but they were told to read the text for entertainment, for sheer pleasure. And uh, the scientists were examining the brain activities as students engaged in these activities. What they found is really interesting because it is the same piece of text or the same stimulus that has been given as an input, but different regions of the brain lit up depending on the purpose with which students approach the task. So our attitude and purpose when we read seems to impact how we process and digest the information. So we have made a shift from a slower, deliberative print culture to a faster, less reflective digital one. When we read print books, we may linger over a word, we may um, reread a sentence, or even flip back a few pages to make a connection with something we read earlier. But reading online is very different. It's more hurried and harried. And uh, when we read electronically, we are constantly making decisions because there are so many choices tugging at our attention. Should we click on the hip hyperlink? Uh, do I ignore the advertisement? Or maybe it's something that is important that would help me. So we have to keep making these decisions and this fragments and scatters our attention. So as we read more and more, uh, information online, our attention gets more and more scattered. And many of you may have experienced this happening to yourselves. Uh, it's, I mean, it's even happened to Marianne Wolf, who's a really voracious reader. I mean, she's a professor and she admits it in her book that she herself finds deep reading uh, challenging. So if we continue to read using the skim and scan and browse method, the cognitive processes that developed when we read print books in a slower, more contemplative way may not develop when we read only electronically, unless we make a concerted effort to change our ways. Uh, Nicholas Carr again uh, describes a study uh, with 6,000 kids uh, where these were digital natives who have grown up using the internet. Uh, and the 6,000 kids were interviewed on their reading habits. And most of them admitted to skimming and scanning while reading. Now, skimming and scanning are not bad in and of themselves. We have always skimmed and scanned newspapers and glossy magazines. But when skimming and scanning become the dominant mode of reading, then we have a problem. Wolf outlines the cognitive skills we lose when we forego slow, deep reading. Okay, the first is imagery. Imagery in the context of reading does not merely denote visual images. It includes sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and even emotions and textures. A skilled writer can actually transport us to a different age or era, a different place, or even a different body. You've all probably had the experience of having um, a book 
almost play out like a video in your mind's eye as you were reading. And then when the movie version of the book came out, you're either disappointed and in rare instances, you may be delighted when the cinematography uh, matches up with the images you conjured up in your head. Another skill that may be at risk if we forego deep reading is empathy. Empathy involves taking on another pers person's perspective. It involves a blend of knowledge and feeling. It involves looking at the world through the eyes of another. Taking on another person's perspective helps us question our own assumptions, our own biases. It widens our horizons and helps us understand the common humanity between all of us. And engaging in perspective taking is, uh, involves what Wolf co calls cognitive patience. Now, Wolf cites uh, MIT scholar, uh, sociologist Sherry Turkle, who bemoans a, a lack of empathy amongst college students nowadays. And Turkle attributes this lack of empathy to youngsters to their, to their being tethered to their devices. So as you can see in this photograph, uh, these four youngsters are together, but at the same time, they're not together. And ironically, even when they go home and are alone in their rooms, they are not alone because they are still connected to their friends through their devices. As a result of these constant pings and connections, uh, youngsters these days don't necessarily spend time alone with their thoughts, with themselves. As a result, they have less time for self-reflection, which is very essential, especially at this age when identities are being constructed. And this lack of connection and self-reflection also erodes their ability to empathize with others. Because if you don't know yourself, it's hard to know another. Another eminent reading scholar, Keith Stanovich, uh, way back in 86 said, the educationally rich get richer and the educationally poor get poorer. This is called the Matthew effects in background knowledge and uh, it refers to a passage in the Bible. When we read, we acquire background knowledge. And the more background knowledge we acquire, the more we are able to read because we're able to comprehend a wider variety of texts. So reading in a sense tends to be cumulative. The more you read, the easier it becomes. So nowadays, I must admit that there are other sources through which we can acquire background knowledge, including audio and video formats. Wolf says that another skill that uh, deep readers develop is the ability to make analogies or connections. Uh, when we read, we draw parallels between what we read and our lives and what we witness in the world or another text. And these analogies help us use the other cognitive processes that are involved in deep reading. So making analogies makes it easier for us to draw inferences, make, predict make predictions, ask questions, determine importance, etc. So the cognitive skills we acquire through deep reading build on each other. We need to ask ourselves whether we want to become passive consumers of information or do we want to make thoughtful decisions based on questioning, critiquing, analyzing the information we encounter. Are we able to identify an author's assumptions, question their motives, provide an alternative perspective or critique the validity of their conclusions? 
Given the surfeit of information we are glutted with, often of dubious quality, it becomes imperative for us to become discerning readers and thinkers. Every once in a while, when we read, we are blessed with an aha moment. Occasionally, when we have read many disparate sources, many different texts, all the reading processes may work in concert and we may glimpse what Wolf calls whole new thoughts. Because reading and the thinking it fosters engenders insight. What is the aim of reading and processing information deeply? Why should we develop critical reasoning? Why should we be discerning readers? What do we gain by taking on another's perspective? As human beings, aren't we constantly trying to find meaning in our lives? And reading definitely helps in this endeavor. The cognitive skills we acquire when we read are essentially thinking skills and they are not limited to reading alone. The thinking skills can be applied to context beyond reading. They are not limited to the two covers of a book or the four walls of a library. For reading to really matter, we need to apply what we read to our lives as well, so that hopefully we live wiser, richer, deeper, and more meaningful lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aruna, for sharing that. Um, I, I'd like to invite readers uh, to share their questions as uh, we go along. Um, I'll chat with Aruna and I have loads of questions. So, you know, keep yours coming because uh, I can otherwise keep mine going all the way till the end. So, Aruna, that was, uh, that was a little bit, that was very informative, but a little bit scary as well. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all this information with us um, and for keeping it simple as well. Uh, I will in a bit ask you about the science of reading. But before that, you know, you spoke about many connections that readers make and you spoke about how when we skim and the letter F when we are doing digital reading, um, so it, that we follow in our reading. So I, I'm just wondering about surfaces deep reading work you know and i think there are many uh, the fact is as you said that the in, the digital revolution is fantastic in many ways we know much more about issues and we know the questions of today we know where we stand but we also seem to know less about uh, the knowledge for solutions so it's almost like marion wolf and also you are saying that we live in a world of um, you know, social media manipulation, and um, and that feels like a little bit like that new movie, The Social Dilemma, where there is so much being done to pull us in that direction of uh, social media, and including Gmail, which is supposed to be addictive. Um, so, so, so she also speaks about uh, digital experiences and how they impede the formation of the slower cognitive processes like critical thinking, reflection, imagination, empathy, which you touched on throughout your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering now, you know, I mean, this is all very scary. And but the fact is, we are here in the digital revolution. We know that social dilemma tells us that, you know, that is what is going to draw our brain and attract our brain. The push factor seems to be great that reading is really hard. The pull factor is, is very easy that let's go to the easy solutions, Google searches. What, what is the solution? What is the solution for this? How do we, how do we, how do we create the environment for uh, building deep reading? Should we just leave digital devices at the door? Do you have some thoughts on, on, on what our listeners could be doing, what we could be doing in schools as parents? Yeah, thank you, Kavita. That's a very significant point that you have raised. Um, the first step when it involves any kind of behavioral change involves self-awareness. So first, we need to know that these digital devices 
our fragmenting and scattering our attention. Uh, so the first we need to know the cause uh, of uh, what is happening. While the conveniences and the benefits of the net are immense and they are part and parcel of our lives, we cannot necessarily leave the devices at our door all the time. We need to ensure that we are in control of our devices as opposed to our devices controlling us, which is increasingly that's what seems to be happening. Uh, Cal Newport is a computer scientist and an author who has written a book uh, on deep work Um, variant of work that involves uh, distraction-free periods of sustained concentration where we push ourselves to our cognitive limits. And deep reading is a form of deep work, but Newport doesn't limit it to reading. It, it, it can involve any other activities also. And he has some very valuable suggestions on how we can all cultivate uh, deep work habits in our lives. So uh, foremost, uh, he says that uh, we should not rely on willpower alone to get us to perform deep work. We all want to do more, we want to be productive. But at the end of the day, we end up, you know, going through emails and Twitter feeds and, you know, three hours have gone and, you know, you feel you have wasted your time. Um, so he cautions us, A, not to conflate busyness with productivity. We have to always keep an eye on the ball of what productivity entails. And that's different for each of us, depending on our occupation or our jobs and what we intend to accomplish with our lives. So that's something each person has to craft for themselves. But that said, don't rely on willpower alone. Instead, we need to create rituals and routines in our lives, which almost become sacred, where we carve out these spaces and times when we are going to engage in deep, sustained work without distraction. And for this, we need to tell our family members or co-workers that we cannot be uh, disturbed during this sacred time. And uh, Further, uh, we need to have goals, longer term goals that are broken down into shorter term ones. And we need to keep a measure of our progress and productivity, which can become self-motivating in and of themselves as you see yourself uh, every day that you are accomplishing so much. If you, if you say, I want to read uh, uh, 75 pages a day, as if you set that as your target, say, and any each day that you accomplish it, you put a little star on your Google calendar. And as you see those stars accumulating, it becomes uh, motivating. Uh, and I have used this for myself uh, when I write. I, uh, you know, it, it does uh, uh, help you motivate yourself. And finally, he says to sustain productivity, if we want to be productive through our lives, we need to also schedule downtime for ourselves. We shouldn't forget that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, it's interesting that you you talk about stars because that's the traditional um, reward that we give to students as well, right? For no, I give myself a lot of stars. Too. Gold stars, <laughs> gold stars, or any stars, sketch pen stars. But you know, I'm mean, we're also told that uh, reading is not something that we should create rewards for. But what you're saying is something very different. You're saying it's okay to create rewards for doing the hard work. Right. Yeah, and especially when when it's uh, self motivated, uh, when you're giving your own self rewards, I think th that's especially effective. How would we, how would this relate to children? I'm thinking, you know, and I think it's you know when we are self motivated and we are sort of and we talk about the different age groups and she speaks, Marion Wolf speaks about the different parts of the brain that are engaged in this in this hard process of reading and you know so there's this the the cognition uh, is sort of like right at the frontal cortex within the frontal cortex and we know that the frontal cortex is is not we used to think that it was it would be fully developed by age 18 but we know that it continues to develop even until 25 for children so surely our children in preschools and schools don't know how to be self-controlled and to know how to build the intrinsic motivation towards reading. How do we do this for children? How do we nurture that habit of reading for children? 
Okay. Um, first, I think we, we need to Not model specific. deep reading by being a deep reader yourself, because I think uh, kids more than what we say, what we do matters to kids as all parents would know. Um, then read aloud to them, especially when they're young children. But this doesn't have to be limited to younger children. It can continue well into the teenage years as a bonding activity between parent and child where you read together something that you both, both enjoy. Uh, that, that also creates a very strong bond between parent and child. Uh, and then create a literacy rich household where children are encouraged to ask questions, form their opinions, uh, Uh, and um, of books uh, available, or at least that they know, you know, what is out there uh, for them to read. But don't impose your tastes and opinions on them, because I think for a reader to really become a deep reader, it has to be self-motivated in the long term, and they need to be able to form their own tastes and preferences. And we need to validate their thinking as well, if we want to cultivate deep readers mm -hmm. and involve kids in discussions, uh, whether it's politics, economics, the environment or social issues, uh, you know, give it, of course, it has to be suit to, suited to their developmental level, but allow kids to enter into these discussions and form their opinions. Um, then you can also encourage different forms of self-expression like music, painting, uh, drama uh, and any other creative endeavor because all of this contributes to uh, literacy in a broader sense and uh, write letters to your kids now and then this is you know al almost a quaint activity but we, we've read a book that's written through letters and you right. mentioned earlier to me that the book club for kids was also uh, it was a book through letters letters can be especially powerful um, especially when we want to convey something special, deep and meaningful. Uh, so I think there are a variety of ways you can also create routines, uh, family routines, where you have storytelling time or you, you know, you enact plays together, uh, you do shared, you do poetry reading, uh, depending on the kids interests. And finally, limit screen time, including your own. Right, right. That seems to be the critical one, or at least yes. balance it out. The right? hard one, yeah. Balance it out at least, and you know, I think it's uh, you. You just spoke about this, uh, and reading comes in many forms, and uh, you know, including. And we know that the Nobel uh, Committee now recognizes that. Uh, the, the the prize in literature goes to different uh, forms of production. You know, there's music, there's, of course, uh, different kinds of genres of writing. Um, so, and we know that reading comes in many forms, you know, it's videos and uh, text and, uh, you know, media, and there's short form and long form and uh, different forms of uh, novels itself uh, that exist and movies uh, would also be considered possibly a form of reading, right? Um, I mean, what is, um, what's good and bad? And, you know, I think it, 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 it does is, does all of this need different skills and it just feels like when you're thinking of all these different kinds of reading and each one of them needs to have different pathways in our brain um it feels like the the, the job of reading just became a hard job became much much harder can you can you talk about you know describe that you know is it different different processes for each one of these forms of reading or is it the same thing Okay, I think reading takes many forms, like you said, and um, they all nurture deep thinking skills in their own ways. Uh, there is a lot of overlap of skills, but some skills are um, specific to a particular medium uh, or activity. So listening to podcasts and audio books also promotes the same array of cognitive uh, skills like when you read print uh, printed text. Uh, but we can broaden our definition of reading even further to include visual and performance arts as well. Um, so just as we decode, interpret, analyze, critique and emote with a book, we can do the same for a painting, a movie, a dance performance, uh, or, or a drama. Uh, when we get children or when we ourselves think, what is the surface meaning 
and what is the underlying meaning being conveyed? How does the artist achieve this? Uh, I think we all stand to gain when we acknowledge and appreciate that reading can take varied forms because it only broadens our vision and expands how we view the world. And I think one form can uh, deepen our understanding of another form. Right, right, right. Thanks. Thanks. You know, so shifting gears a little bit towards empathy, um, and you spoke about that, building empathy and building relationships. Um, I'm just wondering that how does this work? Because reading seems to be, and in the book, uh, Mar uh, Marion Wolf speaks about how um, how it's, it's a, in, in the words of Proust, um, that it is a fertile um, process of communication, which is affected in solitude, right? Uh, but but there's a lot of stuff in there about Cherry Turkin, MIT scholar and author of Alone Together, talking about uh, the loss of empathy and the inability to navigate the online world without losing track of real time face to face relationships. Sarah Conrath um, is cited in their Stanford study that 40% decline in empathy in the last uh, 20 years and much of that in the last 10 years. Um, you know, technology, she speaks about, uh, Marion Wolf speaks about technology places us at a remove, which changes not only who we are as individuals, but also who we are with others. And she speaks about how reading is important to nurture that relationship uh, with, with yourself and with others and recognizing the other, not as a, as a sinister other, but an other with whom you can see similarities and differences. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about emotion she continues in, uh, in her third letter to talk about sentences as a feelable thought. And I think that's so beautiful. Um, and talks about how you know, emotions connect with everything and, and how you feel make you almost physically move. And she talks about the motor area of our region affected by reading. So all of this, when we are saying that reading is something that is done so much in solitude, how can reading that is done so much in solitude, how can it contribute to uh, empathy like this? How can it contribute to building relationships? Uh, that's a very deep question, uh, Kavita. Um, see, empathy involves taking on the perspective of another. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it involves two aspects, uh, both knowing and feeling. And I think reading definitely can aid in the knowing aspect. It helps us see the world from another person's perspective. Uh, and that uh, helps us uh, question our own assumptions and broadens our perspective, okay? But that said, reading will not translate into real world acts of empathy unless it is also coupled by the feeling aspect. And for the feeling aspect uh, to emerge, the person has to be motivated to care. And most importantly, Reading needs to be coupled with humility, which involves acknowledging our shared humanity with every living being on this planet. Um, in fact, reading can do the inverse uh, because reading can also uh, sometimes give people intellectual hubris where they feel superior because they have read oh. so much right. and they know more than others. Uh, and in that case, reading can actually erode empathy. So uh, it it all depends on how the the blend of uh, feeling and knowing. Right, right, right. So recognizing that clearly, I can see that Kartika is here. So which means it's time for us to stop our talking, and uh, she has questions. But Kartika, if you run out of them, please let me know. I have lots more. Absolutely. Thanks, Kavita. It was fascinating to listen to both of you, and absolutely loved all of it. Um, we also have some great questions that have come in. We're going to start with a question from Meher Sonal. Um, there seems to be a lot of debate over this, but is there any difference between reading fiction and nonfiction when it comes to becoming a strong reader? Uh, it all depends on how you define, you know, what a strong reader is. Um, reading fiction and nonfiction definitely make different cognitive demands on the reader. Um, but I think uh, we should leave, uh, the reading choices should be made by the readers themselves 
as opposed to being uh, foisted from other by other people. Um, because uh, if we want to promote deep thinking, we need to encourage people to make their own judgments and preferences regarding books. If we, you know, because even in terms of fiction, there is the, what is called, you know, highbrow literature, and then the more, you know, the entertainment kind of the uh, your Mills and Boons kind, which is kind of the the lowbrow. Uh, but when we make these distinctions, um, and if we disparage a reader of say light fiction, uh, we are invalidating their uh, preferences and opinions. And I think that goes against the grain of developing deep thinking. So for creativity and curiosity and independence of thought to flourish, I think we need to respect a diverse array of uh, readers and a multiplicity of voices which may not sound like our own. And I think we really need to encourage that. So right. the moment we define reading as good reading involves, you know, reading a prescriptive set of books, we are drawing a wall around reading and ultimately isn't reading about breaking barriers and boundaries. Uh, so it's best for readers to uh, identify what they like based on their preferences and predilections. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if others think you are a reader. What matters is whether you see yourself as one. Thanks so much, Aruna. I think, I would, think you, Aruna, would you, would you, uh, I'm wondering whether you, you, would you look at it as some sort of a hierarchy of uh, reading capabilities or something? I'm wondering, you know, I mean, Marianne Wolf in a book talks about many different authors and, you know, you almost feel like you've read absolutely nothing after you're done with uh, reading her, um, reading her writing. And um, I mean, is there something you mentioned a good reader and, you know, is there such a thing as a good reader? And good I'm if you enjoy reading and if it gives you meaning, you are a good reader. Yes. I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe in this hierarchy of reading. It's very easy to feel daunted, yeah. you know, when by somebody like Marianne Wolf, who is, you know, who has read so widely and deeply. Yes. But I think ultimately reading has to have meaning to for ourselves. It's a very personal thing. Uh, so I think we each should define uh, what we want to read. And if you gain pleasure from reading, that makes you a good reader. Right. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks. It's actually a great segue into another question and another thought, which is completely related. Uh, what if a reader is not a reader from childhood and has started reading just lately? How do you bridge the gap for the years when one has not read? Okay. I have a confession to make. Uh, I, as if as a child, I would uh, probably characterize myself as a reluctant reader. Uh, reading was not my favorite activity. Uh, I was more into making charts and posters. And, and I remember my dad used to get very upset that he would open magazines to read and the you know, picture would already be cut up. And he said, magazines are for reading, not for cutting up. Uh, I did read my share of Enid Blyton's. I enjoyed the boarding school series. But I didn't really start seriously reading till about grade eight or nine, when I you know, read the Little Women series and the Jane Austen novels, et cetera. And I, I don't think, I mean, you know, there's ever like, you know, making up, what do you make up for? I mean, you have the rest of your life to read. Uh, I mean, uh, so, uh, and then I, you know, uh, you know probably grew to reading uh, Tolstoy and A.J. Cronin and Somerset Mom. But I still didn't read nonfiction till I went to college. In my school years, it was you know primarily fiction, and it was only in college that I started reading uh, across disciplines and fields. And it was only after college that, um, because I picked a field that I loved, the, uh, the reading for pleasure and for work became one and the same. Uh, that distinction kind of evaporated, and I continue to read a lot in my field and outside and. Uh, Reading also segued into another activity that uh, gives me immense satisfaction, which is writing. So I, if I was a parent, I wouldn't worry if your kid is, you know, not an early start. I mean, uh, I think we all take our own trajectories and uh, I think we should give children the space to carve their own paths. Thanks so much, Aruna. I think it's absolutely heartening advice uh, for everybody who's listening in. We, I think we have time for one last question. So this question comes in from Babul Das. 
Is it possible that just as being bilingual has its merits, that digital and print could complement each other in making positive impacts on our brains in terms of cognitive richness? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the later chapters in Marianne's book uh, uh, touch upon this in a, a, a far deeper way. That's why I didn't go into that in, during my presentation. She calls what she calls cultivating a biliterate brain, just like we have a bilingual brain where we learn to read at, uh, the, at the skimming surface level, which is also an essential skill because you don't want to waste time reading something that's of not, uh, uh, something that you don't need to remember or something that you don't need to process deeply. Uh, so we need to cultivate both skills. Uh, but what she's worried in this book is that we are focusing more on the skimming and scanning and forgetting the deep reading. So yeah, absolutely. I don't think the net... Uh, we can say the net is, uh, you know, a negative force. It has definitely improved all our lives in tremendous ways. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, even, you know, when you research, uh, when I do a lot of research, it's done online and I couldn't have done it if I didn't have the net. So uh, uh, I think uh, we'd, it's, the net has also given us a lot of riches, which we should be thankful for. Thanks so much, Arana. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll read uh, for uh, many of the questions I can see we've not been able to answer, particularly the questions on how to get a young child to read, how to get your child to read, how to get your child to read more. I'd invite everyone to, uh, to really read this book. And I think it's beautiful. So if you read the future chapters and also these first three chapters, they, it, they are so, um, they're, and, and they're not prescriptive. As she says, there's nothing binary about becoming a reader. It's, there's no binary process. There are many, many different processes and we all de develop different reading circuits in our brain based on languages, based on what we are reading, how we are reading. Each one of us has individual circuits. But the fact that she always says is reading needs work to be built. So I'll end with uh, reading one short paragraph, which is at the end of letter three. Um, and that is the formation of the reading brain circuit is a unique epigenetic achievement in the intellectual history of our species. Within this circuit, deep reading significantly changes what we perceive, what we feel, and what we know. And in so doing, alters, informs, and elaborates the circuit itself. Um, she shares this drawing of, by Catherine Studley. Catherine Studley's final drawing of the reading brain illustrates how beautifully elaborated the deep reading circuit becomes. And as the next letter describes, however, the implication of the reading brain's plasticity makes its future iterations in a digital milieu a matter of great consequence and no small uncertainty. And with that, we end our session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Aruna, for taking the time out to do this. It's been, um, it's been wonderful to talk and to listen to, um, to you. Uh, we hope to see all of you listeners and audience here for, uh, for our next session on September 23 for the second session of the NLF Imaginary Lines Book Club for Parents and Educators from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. We will be joined that day by Katie Day, a wonderful teacher librarian and children's literature specialist from Singapore. Do read letters four, five, and six for a more enriching experience. Take care, stay safe, and happy reading. <laughs>